All right, it's time to talk with our featured guest, Dr. Ivan Valkaringi. Ivan, how's it going? It's going well. It's going well. Nice to talk to you today. No, nice talking to you. If you don't mind me asking, where are you located? We're located in Elmhurst, Illinois, which is about 25 miles out of the city of Chicago in the suburbs. Nice. Okay. How's the weather like over there right now? It's We've had a, a gorgeous summer. It's beautiful here. One of the reasons why I'm still in Illinois, uh, as you know, a lot of people have left uh, Illinois to go to Tennessee or Florida, but uh, we stayed in Illinois because for the, for the most part, um, we love it here. The, the greenery, I have family in California who came here to visit me uh, this summer, and uh, they mentioned how green it is here and how nice it is here, and they had forgotten uh, since they moved to California like 30 years ago. And so Illinois is actually very beautiful during the summertime, spring, fall. Those winters get a little long at times. Is it, what's the, would you say it gets really humid and hot out there? No, not really. Yeah, but, uh, you know, uh, for 75 years old, I have this beautiful skin because of this humidity. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I like that. I like that a lot. Okay. And I'm good. not really 75, but that's what I always say. <laughs> we have a uh, facial business here. And, uh, and so I always tell people, uh, don't I look good for 75? It's because of our facial business. <laughs> <laughs> people are like, sign me up. Sign me up now. <laughs> That's good. That's good, Ivan. So tell us a little bit about your past, your present. How did you get to where you are today? Oh, my goodness. You know, I've been in practice 36 years. Uh, you're, you're asking a question that could possibly uh, I could write a book on. But um, basically, uh, you know, dentistry has taken me uh, through several offices, several different reinventions. And, uh, you know, to keep it interesting, uh, the burnout uh, in, in dentistry is so high. It's something like 60%. And so if you don't find ways to really make it exciting and, and be passionate about something, uh, you could uh, suffer the, the burnout that so many dentists do. Mm -hmm. So over my career, um, just even getting into dentistry was kind of unusual. I don't know if you want me to go back that far, but yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Okay. So just even getting in, I have two brothers, two older brothers, seven and a half, eight and a half years older than me that are physicians. Everybody in my family is in healthcare. And uh, so even getting into dentistry was something unique. Um, I discovered a couple of things I didn't like about medicine as I was experiencing medicine through my brothers and working in hospitals and even convalescent centers was it was kind of a negative uh, environment. It was full of sick people. And, and uh, I, I didn't like that part of it. And then I didn't like the lifestyle part of it. Um, I don't mind being identified as a dentist. Uh, I've rarely uh, introduce myself as Dr. Ivan Valkaringi because I have so many other interests and uh, dentistry seemed to provide the time to, uh, to cultivate those interests. So, you know, I was a near professional cyclist for 26 years. Uh, I was a, a court pro uh, in tennis. Um, I like to jump out of airplanes, uh, race cars. I had a lot of interests and I couldn't see doing that in medicine because it's, it's so all pervasive medicine, it's your whole life. Mm -hmm. And so when I looked at my older brothers and their lifestyle and how medicine just occupied their entire lives, I thought, let me try this dentistry thing out and see if that's any, any different. And I took a pre-dental course in college and it was all about doing things with your hands and carving things out of wax. And we actually made a goblet on a lathe. I mean, where do you get to do that? and uh, in a profession. And so that kind of turned me on now. So that, I, I went into dentistry and, and, you know, it was very exciting to go through the early years of dentistry. But then when you get into practice, the reality of practice is very different. It's not all fun. It's not all artistic. Uh, in fact, it's very, um, very, uh, I, I would say, traditional. Everything in dentistry was done before you by other dentists. And so you're kind of into this uh, uh, routine. And so that was kind of difficult for me in the, in the beginning was to learn how to be myself and be distinguishable from other dentists. Mm -hmm. And that's very difficult because dentistry is done a certain way and everybody does it the certain way. And so early on in my practice, um, first of all, I was, I was in the public health service for three years and that was not super rewarding. It was rewarding in the fact that we were helping people in underserved areas. But then when I started my practice, I started from scratch because I couldn't find a practice to purchase. 
And it was a, it was a, it was really providential at that time because I got to create the practice that I wanted rather than what was expected of me and what some other dentist had built. Mm -hmm. And so starting my practice from scratch while difficult uh, proved very um, a good way to uh, use my artistic side of my uh, and creative side of my brain. And uh, as an Italian, we have a culture rich in in history and a, a culture rich in ar arts and sciences as well. So that was really providential. And uh, starting my own practice, I realized, wow, this is this is really great. We can learn how to build something ourselves, and we we win and lose on our own efforts, not somebody else's efforts. Um, and while it was difficult to build it initially, we found our legs early on. Now, I'm going to keep talking unless you stop me. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. I like it. I want to rewind a little bit. Um, Go ahead. You said you realize practice reality is very different. It's not all uh, fun and artistic. Was there ever a moment where you were like, uh, I'm going to go back. I want to go back to being an associate, just getting like a, a check, working on my craft, being artistic instead of having to deal with the, the business side of things. Right. So when you go into dentistry, uh, most dentists around here anyway, work evenings and weekends. Uh, they plug up teeth with uh, metal fillings uh, uh, in the early years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just didn't understand why we would work on, let's say, a Saturday when that's our highest cancellation rate day. And why would we um, why do we plug up people's teeth with uh, metal fillings when there were these white fillings out there that looked very promising. Mm -hmm. And so I started asking questions about why we do the things we do. And uh, when you start from scratch, you also have to understand a little bit about how to build a practice. Nobody teaches you that in dental school. And so I started looking for answers. I hired consultants and uh, started realizing you need to learn marketing pretty well. So today, when people ask me, what do you do for a living? Uh, usually by the fourth hole in a, when I go golfing, um, I tell them I'm a businessman, but I'm also a dentist and uh, um, I've learned to grow my business through marketing, technology, education, uh, communication. And I also did attend business school for a little while. I, I didn't complete it, but boy, did it teach me so much. Um, nobody teaches you marketing in dental school. So we learned how to, how to build a practice through bringing people in. My first practice was right by the train station here in Elmhurst. Hmm. 25,000 people walked by my office every day, but nobody was walking in. And so I realized, how do we get people to come in? And so I hired some consultants, uh, started business school and learned this marketing 101 that you have to actually uh, find a way to attract people to come to your office. They'll walk right by your office and never even notice you're there. I remember we did a survey asking people, do you know where Valley Family Dental was? That's what was my first business. And uh, the response we got back was, was pathetic. And then after about uh, five years of marketing and building our practice, uh, we had actually overgrown our two operatory uh, office. We outgrew it. And we were doing some incredible numbers in this little hole in the wall, all because we learned how to market and communicate with the public. So I don't know if that answered your question, but um, that was the beginning of the growth and the, the difficult times were those first five years. They told me that it would take five years and sure enough, it did. It took five years. Wow. And then you started from scratch because you couldn't find the pra a practice to purchase. How did you find right. this practice? And what were the difficulties that came with it besides the marketing as far as building up construction and things like that? Well, initially, you're trying to save as much money as possible. You don't even know if a bank is going to loan you enough money to, to do anything because your income is so uh, pathetic at that time. And school loans, you're, you're you know, up to your ears in debt. And even at that time, the, the debt was significant. Today, it's even more significant. And we could probably talk about the rise in corporate dentistry and DSOs. Um, is probably the largest reason is because of the debt that a lot of students are in. Well, even back then, some of the difficulties were uh, really the biggest difficulty was just learning this this business of dentistry. How do you how do you run a practice? How do you get the how do you keep in communication with your clients? And how do you provide a high quality service? 
when you're in a little hole in the wall storefront office and it, uh, it's got orange uh, paint on the wall and the carpet is not in the best shape and you don't have uh, a, an extra dime to, to rub together to, to buy anything uh, or do any kind of remodeling. And so we had to really polish our skills and our communication skills, learned how to um, you know, discuss uh, and educate our patients about the qualities of dentistry. So that was kind of the beginning was learning that dentistry doesn't have to be necessarily the way that you were taught it was supposed to be. We discovered that asking patients if they wanted quality dentistry was something that was really novel in our practice and, and novel in dentistry. Most dentists make the decision to do the kind of dentistry that they want to do on their patients. And usually, and here's the weirdest thing, this is going to sound very weird, but uh, dentists make the decision to do the cheapest dentistry on the vast majority of patients across this country. And if you want to see evidence of that, I love, I, I love this uh, example. If you watch the view or not the view, the um, what's the name of those music shows like American Idol uh -huh. and uh, the voice, it was the voice. I love watching those music shows. I love uh, singing and, and music. And when you see these kids open their mouths and sing, you see a mouthful of metal fillings. So you know that dentists are still doing metal fillings out there in bulk and quite a bit. Well, I discovered cosmetic dentistry early on in my career, and I realized these white fillings are way better than these metal fillings. They stick to your teeth. You don't have to drill as much of the tooth away. It's tooth colored. Sorry about the phone ringing in the background. No worries, no worries. Um, I'll try to turn that off, but anyway, so I started asking my patients, hey, would you want, you know, better dentistry, uh, dentistry that's tooth colored rather than metal, metal colored? Mm -hmm. And uh, would you like inlays and onlays, which are customized filling? They're, they're made uh, more durable. They're harder. Um, they, they last longer. You don't have to mess with these fillings again. Whereas the metal fillings you know, corrode in the mouth and, you know, you're drinking and eating all sorts of stuff during your lifetime. And I would tell you, most of my patients were just all decided, yeah, um, you know, I'd rather have the better looking stuff and, yeah. the, and, the, and the stuff that doesn't drill away as much of my teeth. And so I started doing that and uh, we became very successful very quickly. Patients like quality. They may tell you that they want, you know, um, just a regular dentist, let's say, or, or they may go to a practice that gives them, you know, cheaper fees. But really, most of us want better quality in our, in our entire lives. And so quality dentistry was something we introduced early and it became very successful. We grew to uh, so large in that two operatory office, we ended up building a seven operatory office. Um, and at that time, $750,000 was a, a tremendous amount of money to build a new office. Yeah. And even in that first year, we grew 25%. So there's a demand, especially in a nice community like Elmhurst, for quality dentistry and better um, and a better environment. We had a beautiful office, colonial style, and uh, patients commented uh, very often about how wonderful it was to be in our practice. Yeah, so that was nice. some of the difficulties leading to some of the benefits. How did you polish your communication skills? Like, how did you ask the patients? You just would talk to them, even though they were first brand new. They just like, I just want a cleaning, uh, Ivan. And then they're like, oh, you started talking to them about onlays and stuff like that. Or how did you approach it? Yeah, great question. And and one of the, and, and a couple of the tough questions to, to answer early on was, you know, uh, does insurance cover it? Mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. question threw so many dentists off. Well, I did do consulting and, uh, and I also learned how to uh, be a, I became a Toastmaster and, but that was all pretty easy to me. My father was a, uh, was a public speaker mm -hmm. and a pastor. And, uh, and so it kind of was in my blood. I spoke in front of audiences many times and, and, and speaking to people was not difficult, but when I was going through the consulting it was kind of, it was interesting to watch how doctors really struggled with communicating with patients about, you know, dentistry, just telling them what dentistry um, or what problems they had and, and what dentistry could solve their problems and what the cost of treatment was. I remember one dentist, uh, we told him to tell, uh, to, we were training him how to say what the fee of the, of the, 
uh, of the crown was, which I think at that time was $500, which is about a third of what it is today, if not a fourth. And uh, he was struggling so much. He was, he was saying, uh, ma'am, this crown is. <laughs> and, and it was, uh, it kind of made me laugh because, it, you know, that's not difficult for me to, to say what things cost. Uh, when you go to the store, they tell you what it costs. You either pay it or you don't. Uh-huh. Um, when you go buy a car, it's, you know, th- tens of thousands of dollars and uh, the dealer has no problem, you know, collecting that money from you. Mm-hmm. So I was wondering why do we dentists have such a hard time telling patients the cost? So I think it kind of came natural, but I did have some uh, uh, training. I did do some communication training and had consultants and it was very, very beneficial to learn, you know, what do patients uh, hear and what do they want? And one of the things I discovered is I'm really good at talking, but I'm not as great at listening. And so it's when you learn the skill of listening, which is the number one rule in a communication cycle, is you just sit back and just watch patients and listen to patients and really duplicate what they're saying. It's kind of like marriage counseling almost, where they make you duplicate what your marriage partner says Mm -hmm. so that you really understand what they say. And when you learn that communication cycle, you, you, you then develop a relationship with that patient. You know, they call it uh, just rapport in the beginning, in the first stage. But um, when somebody feels really listened to, it's amazing the magic that happens between two individuals. And so learning l- listening skills was, was probably the most important communication skill there was. And then learning to articulate um, the options of treatment, which you would think would come natural to dentists. You know, it's called an informed consent. You have to tell patients what the options of treatment are, what the risks of treatment, the risks of not treatment. And amazingly, we have a hard time doing that in our profession. Mm -hmm. Um, When I became really good at it, it was just amazing how it worked. Patients, you know, understood, they felt good about their choices and they were informed about their choices. And also judgment is a part of that as well. If a patient chooses a treatment that you really don't think is the best treatment for them, you have to respect that decision. And so I would not judge them. I would say, you know what, that's your health, your decision, and I will honor that decision. So those are things that if I could teach young people today what to do when they start in practice and how to communicate with patients, that would be step number one. To uh, listen, like communicate, listen, validate their point. Kind of like that. That's interesting. I like that. Learn to articulate the options of treatment. Um, because if I do feel that that kind of comes to a difficulty where the the patients sometimes like, I just want whatever my insurance can cover. Does my insurance cover that? Does it, doesn't it cover that? No, it doesn't. And then they're, you know, and we're kind of stuck in a way where like automatically we think of discounts as a treatment coordinator and you're like, okay, well, let me just try and discount. This is going to be your option, but we decided to discount it to this. And then they're still struggling accepting that price. So we're kind of like, okay, well, Give us a call whenever you're ready, which I feel is not the best way, right? That's not the best way. Those are those are the little nuances of communication that you learn. Uh, the insurance question was such a tough question. I, I was on the cover of one of our uh, dental economics magazines uh, for being insurance free. I was one of the first guys to uh, to do away with insurance, and it wasn't that hard. Uh, when I got started in practice, uh, it was tough to defeat the phrase permanent fillings. Patients Mm -hmm. thought that their fillings were permanent. And I would have to explain to them that, you know, nothing in life is permanent other than death and taxes. And your fillings uh, that are in your mouth in a wet environment that are under constant pressure um, are going to fail. Or your teeth themselves will fail, even if the filling lasts longer. And so you have to update your fillings. And that was a difficult thing to to communicate to uh, my patients early on. And then once we got better at it, of course, it becomes uh, second nature. And defeating the insurance question, which, you know, all of us know that insurance doesn't pay for everything in dentistry, uh, but the medical community ha- is so reliant on, on insurance that they kind of assume that dentistry is the same way. Mm-hmm. But when you consider that dentistry started in the 70s, uh, dental insurance started in the 70s, I believe, and with a thousand dollars maximum at that time, you could do uh, a whole full mouth of fillings for a thousand dollars. Today, you can't buy one quality restoration for a thousand dollars. And so insurance is still only about $1,200 average in benefits. 
So if you don't learn to communicate this to patients, you're going to be in trouble. And, and if somebody says, does insurance cover it? And you say no, that conversation's over with. You have to find a way to say yes out of no answers, but you know, you're not lying or you're not deceiving anyone. You just have to say, tell them that, hey, insurance doesn't pay for all of dentistry and it only pays for a portion of it. Uh, but good quality dentistry, if you have it done, will be long lasting and provides a, 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 a tremendous value. I mean, your mouth, um, when your mouth is healthy, believe it or not, um, I find that the healthier mouths that we have, also their lives are healthier. People uh, have more esteem and can, uh, and even their confidence to uh, achieve more in their lives. I've seen it over and over, especially uh, because I do a lot of cosmetic dentistry. Uh, when you change people's smiles and improve their smiles, their value for life improves. I can tell you story after story of somebody who has gone on to bigger and greater things once they felt so confident and their esteem went up in dentistry. So these little questions about insurance, uh, to me, they're little questions. They're big questions to a lot of guys, uh, a lot of dentists out there. But uh, uh, when you learn to communicate how silly it is that we make uh, dentistry um, an uh, unattainable thing because it's not paid for by insurance, then you're gonna really limit yourself. You're gonna lose patients and patients aren't gonna to come to you. But when you provide value and you tell them that this is something that will improve your life, will last a long time. Uh, we spend a lot more money on things that don't count half as much. Mm -hmm. Large screen TVs, you know, the cars. I mean, what's the average car go for today? And we're still buying cars in mass. Mm -hmm. um, and, and did you ever wonder why there's so many commercials on TV for cars? They need those commercials to sell you something you really don't need. But dentistry is something that improves your lifestyle, improves your esteem, improves your health and confidence. These are things that they're more valuable than diamonds. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. Those, those difficult questions are not tough to answer once you start putting it in the perspective of, you know, how do we live our lives? Now, if somebody comes to me and says, you know, Dr. Ivan, I can't afford to do this right now. Uh, because I'm I'm remodeling my basement. I'm like totally on board with that. I get it, but don't let it go too long so that it causes you a bigger problem. And when you're ready, come on in and we'll do uh, we'll do your dentistry. Nice. Do you do anything extra to have the patients accept treatment? I don't know. Maybe show them something or anything like that, or it's just pure communication and and that's it. My goodness, Michael, you are asking some of the best questions for a young guy. You're uh, you're you're very astute. So do I provide anything extra? I would say it's not that I provide anything extra. It's, it's, it's providing value for, for dentistry. People don't think about value for dentistry. Do you realize that almost everything in, in our health depends on your mouth? Even the air you breathe comes in through your mouth, the food that you chew, digestion, even sleep apnea today is treated uh, because of the mouth with oral appliances. So the mouth has a tremendous value. And when you pre present that value to patients, you don't have to provide anything extra. And, you know, selling dentistry, to me, it's it sounds like a negative word to sell dentistry, but we are selling dentistry and we're selling ourselves. And number one is, if patients don't feel trust in you, they're not going to trust anything you do or anything you present. Mm -hmm. So one of the important things that I recommend, especially to young dentists, is be very honest. I mean, it, it doesn't be very honest with your patients because that trust comes across. And when people feel trust, which is what they still want out of their professionals, um, they will do what you recommend. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. I don't need to provide discounts. I don't need to provide a lot of extra things. Uh, did I show patients x-rays in the early years? Yes, but that's kind of silly because they don't go to dental school to look at x-rays. I used to use intraoral cameras and show them pictures. Today, I don't need all that stuff. When you walk in my office, um, you can definitely see how this office is, uh, you know, it's very upscale. It's very, uh, very well put together. The technology is obvious. We've got television screens everywhere, computers everywhere. I, I lost track of how many computers we have in this office. Uh, the electronic drill alone, patients love. When I switched to electronic drills, 
uh, my goodness, it's so much quieter and, uh, and they drill so much more um, um, thoroughly and contiguously rather than the old turbines that, you know, squeal in your ear. Oh, oh, oh. Um, <laughs> these electronic drills are so much nicer and patients don't even notice them. The noise that they hear is more from the suction than they do from the drills. And those drills instituted fear in, in a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So now we have these, these uh, electronic drills. And when you're doing digital everything, um, you know, no more do we keep charts. Everything's digital. We're very software driven. Uh, the digital uh, x-rays now, instead of putting all these in individual x-rays in the mouth that hurt a lot of people, uh, it's an external uh, uh, device that takes all the x-rays that we need. We have CT scanning today that gives you information that's incredible. And then now we have the digital scanning, so we don't even put goop in people's mouths and gag them to take mm -hmm. impressions, which has really, really revolutionized um, dental practice. Nice. For the digital scanning, who are you using? Um, I'm using a, 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 um, a coordinated laboratory and software uh, company called Dandy. Dandy is, um, I think, is is revolutionized dentistry today in the way it's done. Previously, as you know, we would take a goopy impression, send it to a laboratory, laboratory would deliver it back in uh, you know, three weeks or so, and uh, then you'd put the, uh, the, the restoration in the patient's mouth. Today, it's all done digitally. You take a scan of the patient's mouth or restoration or preparation, you, you scan it directly into the computer. The computer um, asks you, a, the software asks you a bunch of questions about it. You put in those questions. You have uh, certain um, stipulations about the types of restorations you use and what you want. And then you can actually live chat with your laboratory technician. So it's, it's just remove the, even the time, the timeliness is so much faster. You know, a lot of dentists went uh, through a technology in the office where they would make the restorations in the office. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great. A lot of dentists do it, um, but it's $100,000 a piece of equipment and you're still doing about 15, 20 minutes of laboratory work, basically. I'm not a laboratory technician, I'm a dentist. And so I wanna do dentistry, I wanna diagnose patients. Uh, Dandy has taken all of that all of my doctor instructions, put it into a software integration, fabricates it uh, from those digital scans, and then sends me the restoration by mail, routine mail or FedEx. That has revolutionized dental practice. My patients are like, wow, that is unbelievable. And they, they can actually see their teeth in different dimensions, 3D dimensions that are rotatable up on the screen. And then you I mean, this is the best educational tool we've ever had, better than intraoral cameras. I mean, they can see on the screen their restorations, how their teeth look. So many people comment, oh my God, my teeth are horrible. I need to, I need to have better looking teeth. There's no better uh, educational tool for patients to see their teeth than, than those, uh, that software integration. It's really revolutionary. Yeah, and that helps with the treatment, right? Like acceptance rate, I, I would assume. As far well, as when they look at I, it, you know, I don't have the need to sell treatment um, acceptance like I used to when I was younger. But I would tell you absolutely yes. Any young guy, any young uh, dentist, uh, male or female, who uh, you know has this technology can use this technology to educate their patients and gain treatment acceptance. Uh, when you see that in 3D, it's it's absolutely uh, you know fantastic. Nice. Normally, what's the turnaround time for Dandy? I, I used to be three weeks or longer for any kind of quality dentistry uh, that I was doing. I do a lot of full mouth rehabs, uh, uh, comprehensive cases and cosmetic cases. And it always took at least three weeks. On Dandy, I can have simpler things like night guards turned around within days. I can have more complicated things turned around in two weeks. So that has saved us a lot of time as well. Nice. And did they give you guys the free scanner too, or? Yep. You already knew the answer to that, <laughs> which is a, which is another tremendous benefit because these, uh, this technology is 30, $40,000. Not every dentist can, uh, can invest in that. 
And so when Dandy comes on board and says, look, all we want is for you to give us a minimum amount of dentistry a month, which is easy to, to, to come up with that number. Um, I do about 10 to 12 cases with Dandy a month um, and really one case or maybe two cases at the most, most pays for your, uh, your Dandy experience or collaboration. So it's very inexpensive to be involved with it. And they give you a $30,000, $35,000 piece of equipment and integrate and support you every month um, ad nauseum. I got to tell you, I'm one, I'm probably, they probably think I'm the most annoying do doctor around because I love communication. I will communicate. This is how I want my uh, night guards. I want it in an anterior position. This about a thickness. And I'm, I'm very, very communicative. And I have a lot of experience, so uh, I know what I want. And they've been absolutely fantastic with me. So um, are there some bugs that need to be worked out along the way? Of course, but that's also another huge benefit. I have, I've been met with nothing but positive reinforcement, positive communication from them. No problem, doctor. Uh, they're available all the time. I mean, it's just incredible. Um, I don't know if there's a competitor out there, but I am so pleased that I discovered uh, this technology and Dandy. Thank you for asking about it. Yeah, no, wonderful. That's awesome, Ivan. So transitioning a little bit here, for marketing and advertising, well, right now, how many new patients would you say you're currently getting a month? You know, I if I told you my number, you would be shocked because there are practices that get 100 new patients a month. I don't want 100 patients a month. I don't need 100 patients a month. A long time ago, I discovered the 80-20 rule that 80% of my productivity comes from 20% of my patients. So I don't need a whole lot of new patients. I get one new patient a day at the most, and that's it. So I get about four new patients a week. And from those four new patients a week, when you discuss comprehensive care, when you discuss all of their treatment options and they trust you and you have a beautiful office with the latest technologies, um, it all sells itself um, and patients understand the value of what they're getting. And uh, I have a reputation, I've been around a long time. And so people kind of know that I know what I'm talking about. Uh, so I don't have to do a lot of that kind of marketing um, I do marketing, extensive online marketing, don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but I don't need to do a lot of selling, I guess, is the word I would use. Yeah, I get you. Like at the same time, let me ask you how, if a new patient comes in, how long do you spend time with them for their new patient exam? Yeah. Um, you know, the typical new patient in a dental practice, uh, spends about five minutes with the doctor and that's it. No, I, I actually will sit down across the table. In fact, I'm in that room right now. Mm -hmm. And I would just talk with patients. Hey, what are you looking for? What can I do for you? And sometimes the conversation's only five minutes and they tell me exactly what they want. They say, no, I just want cleanings and checkups and that, that's it. I'll say, fine, no problem. And then if I see something that really sticks out, like, have you ever thought about this or that? I might bring it up. But there are other patients that come in for comprehensive uh, uh, treatment planning and uh, or second opinions. And I will set aside as much as uh, 20, 25 minutes to discuss this with patients. So my consultations could be rather long. Um, the traditional practice might not be able to afford to do you know, 20, 25 minutes of consultation, but I'm not a high volume practice, I'm a quality practice. Um, so I don't need a lot of new patients and I don't, uh, I don't see a lot of consultations, but the consultations I do are really great. We, uh, it, they usually result in, um, I, I would say probably 90% of our patients, if not better than that, uh, become patients and go forward with their plan. That's wonderful. So then what are you currently doing for marketing and advertising? You know, I, I built my first million dollar practice on um, direct mail and direct mm -hmm. mail worked really great. But today, direct mail, um, you know, doesn't work that well. So online presence is really what we do. So I hired a company that does a lot of the communication, online scheduling and organization of our communication with patients online. I have SEO, of course, I have a website, I have online scheduling mm -hmm. for our facial and our dental business. And uh, Facebook, of course, we have regular blogs and regular uh, posts uh, to those uh, Instagram and Facebook. Now, Instagram, 
I've discovered that Instagram, I think, is more of a young person's uh, um, um, uh, device or venue. And so it doesn't work as well when you're talking about um, doing, you know, uh, expensive dentistry. Um, young people like my daughters, you know, Instagram is, uh, is a great place to get information, but it doesn't necessarily bring people in. Facebook is a little better. Google ads are better. And so we have a good online presence. Um, and SEO organic is better. Mm -hmm. uh, Google business is also a good thing to do. Now, LinkedIn is, a, is somewhere where you can do business to business uh, communication. And I'm, we're not good at that yet, but we're starting to get into that. But it's, it's mostly online. The other thing that we're really good about is we're involved in our community. There's no better marketing than people actually meeting you in a, you know, um, a, a natural environment. And they find out you're a good person. And uh, they, they, if they have dentistry that they need, they schedule an appointment because they get to know you and they know that you're, you're a good person. So that kind of uh, exposure you can't buy. Um, but it's important to be out in the community. But yes, online and in person, we do a lot of philanthropy here. Uh, we do about twenty thousand dollars in free dentistry a year, and then we also um, uh, support a charitable organization. Uh, actually, we support a lot of charity organizations, mm -hmm. including American Heart Association, American Cancer Society, um, and a variety of others. Um, I'm involved in dental sleep medicine now. And so we're involved in uh, breathing and, and, uh, and uh, um, cystic fibrosis as well, which is a nasty disease. And so uh, charitable organizations and people want to know that you're using your money to the benefit of other people as well. Yeah, that's true. I like that. Are you still one of, is it mainly your team or is it you who go out to do like the monthly community events, things like that? Or what community events would you recommend and say, do these, don't do these, like sponsor a football team, don't do that. Or, or what do you think? I would, I would never advise people um, because we don't know what their community is like and what their experience is like. You do what you feel uh, uh, drives you. In my case, uh, I would never ask anybody to do something that I wouldn't do myself. So I am perfectly capable of, of I remember in the early years, I, I would go door to door and, and I was actually at the train station handing out our business cards and pamphlets. So I have no problem doing that myself. Y you want to sell your business? Who sells it better than you? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I have no problem doing that. Today, we're a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, I we're doing talks to the community about once every other month. So about three, four times a year really is, is uh, at the most. Um, we'll talk to the community about topics of interest. We, we entertained a, uh, a politician here who's running for uh, county board chairman. And so uh, we had a bunch of people come for that event and that was well received. They got to know the, the, uh, this candidate. And in fact, he, he, he won the primary, but he has to uh, still go through the election, of course, in November. Um, but people got to know his views, how he felt about crime, how he felt about the economy, how he felt about taxes. Mm -hmm. And so we sponsored that. And then I'll talk about something like sleep apnea. I'm one of the few uh, diplomats across the country in sleep apnea and, and uh, dental sleep medicine. And so I think I should be out there talking to patients about uh, this important topic uh, health topic. And so we'll talk about that, or we'll talk about cosmetic dentistry. I've talked about almost every topic under the sun and, uh, we'll invite the public to come to our office. If too many people come to our office, then we'll do it in the atrium. Our atrium can support quite a few people. The last event, we must've had, uh, uh maybe 150 people here. It was kind of neat. Yeah. I like that. Uh, I mean, I like how you, um, go out, but you pick a topic, you know what I mean? You're not just going to talk about, let's, let's try and push everything we do under the sun and tell them everything. That way, whoever listens, they'll come. It's, you hone in on one topic. It's depending on the, I guess, yeah, how do point. you pick? How do you pick on that? Like, how do you decide? Like, okay, I'm going to talk about sleep apnea. I hope people here are going through that or, or how do you? Yeah, you, you have to plan it out. We may look like we're, uh, we're pretty natural and it's flip free flowing, but everything is planned out ahead of time. We pick the day, the time, the topic, we rehearse it. Uh, everybody's on board with it. We know exactly if we're going to offer uh, refreshments or not. 
it's all perfectly planned. Uh, I call it the organized chaos. We, uh, it, there's a lot of things going on, but we organize it into a, uh, a very specific topic and focus. So it's very well rehearsed. We want the public to know that we're very polished at what we do. I like that. And then you also mentioned you have a facial se- section of the practice. Yeah. So uh-huh. I didn't get a chance to tell you, but my, my road through dentistry has, has taken different turns and I've, 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 I've reinvented myself. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to say I've had four different business plans at least. And I think it's good because it keeps you fresh and it keeps you passionate about what you're doing. Well, facial, I, a few years ago, I came across, um, actually it's quite a few years ago now, I came across uh, the trigger point injections for TMJ problems. And I was a TMJ patient, had terrible jaw pain when I got out of dental school. And, um, I, and no doctor could find the, the problem. I went to an ENT, a private ENT, uh, and he told me that it was probably TMJ. And he said, well, you're a dentist. Don't you know about TMJ? And at the time, I didn't know very much. I mean, dentistry, dental school doesn't teach you all the nuances of TMJ that we know today. And so today, uh, and then after that, I, I started getting treatment for T- TMJ. I went and got two and a half years of training at the Las Vegas Institute, a well-known institute for cosmetic and neuromuscular dentistry. So you get educated along the way, you get trained. And when you get trained at a high level in anything, cosmetics, implants, you feel more confident with it. And, and so I, I, I treated myself. And so I started developing it on my patients. And then what that led to was trigger point injections, which is you inject into some of the muscles that are triggering these, uh, the grinding and the pain. And it amazingly beneficial. And in, interestingly, those trigger point injections kind of led me to sleep apnea as well. And so, uh, when you do, when you're used to doing external injections like that, I thought, well, this is Botox that we're injecting in a lot of these patients, and Botox is used for cosmetic pur- purposes facially. And so, there was a lot of patients that were getting, you know, volume um, injections in their faces, and I thought it was excessive. And if they only knew about the combination of how teeth form the lips and a lot of the face and how the jaw forms the face, um, and and with our injectables, conservative injectables, we could actually improve the facial contours of patients and their overall aesthetics. And so I started incorporating uh, these these, uh, services in my uh, my practice, and it led to this facial practice and, and business that I built they're actually under one roof. Maybe someday we'll separate them out, but they're under one roof. And so um, basic good facial care is absolutely essential. So you can't go into a bunch of facial services uh, like microneedling and uh, hydrofacials and injectables and lasers if you don't have good facial structure to begin with in, in the skin. So we hired estheticians. We have estheticians that are medically trained as well. We use medical products as well as uh, other uh, expensive products like Yanka of Paris. And, uh, and so our patients are benefiting from dentistry and facial together. So many people ask us about that. Like uh, we have a car that drives around the, the area that says uh, Radiante Dental and Facial. And so many people stop us and ask us, what do you mean by dental and facial? And so I have to create this elevator pitch to, to people to say why the face and dental comes into contact and why they are, why we're collaborating. And it's because your teeth and your mouth forms a large part of your face and a good facial structure with uh, reduced wrinkles and so forth uh, enhances your aesthetics along with cosmetic dentistry. Yeah. I love that, man. That's so, that's brilliant. You know what I mean? To put those two together and then kind of talk about it. Wonderful. Amazingly successful too. I was, uh, I was shocked. Um, I, I didn't know if, if the facial part of this would be super successful because so when I built this new office, I built the uh, spa rooms uh, the same size as our dental treatment rooms, which are oversized. Uh, I think they are 12 by 12s. The typical dental office, I think is 10 by 12 or no, ours are, ours are 12 by 14s. So I built the spa room 12 by 14, just in case they didn't work and we'd have to make them dental rooms. <laughs> but the spa rooms have been successful. We have, uh, we have a great esthetician here um, that is very medically based, he used to work for a dermatologist. 
And, uh, and so people are starting to get it. We've been open here now four years and it's, uh, it's been, uh, you know, we're, we've got the five-year plan. And I think by five years, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be hitting all of our marks that we originally did with our um, business plan. Nice. Okay. So one of the last questions I wanted to ask you, Ivan, is throughout this process, I guess from the moment you decided to uh, start your own practice, you know what I mean? Like from the, from the ground up till today, what's been some of your biggest struggles or fails or pitfalls? Well, I, I hate to concentrate on the pitfalls and the, and the struggles. You know, some of the struggles are struggles that almost all of us have had, which is the economy. Um, I think in my career, we've had four different economic downturns. Um, you know, I remember 9-11. 9-11 changed a lot of us, 9-11-01. Right after that happened, um, actually, it actually started before that. But right after that happened, I went to my office manager and I said, I'm going to change the way things, uh, uh, the way we're going to do things. I'm so busy. I'm working two evenings. I'm tired. Mm-hmm. And the more patients you see, a lot of dentists don't realize this. They think they need a lot of new patients and they want to have a lot of patients. But the more patients you see, I'm sorry about that phone going off. Let me see if I can lower that. But the more patients you see, the more problems you have. So every Mm. single patient that you treat is a potential problem. So I was spending half my day being productive and half of my day fixing problems. So I decided I'm going to change the way I'm going to do things. I'm, uh, I had 11 employees at the time, and I, I thought, you know what? I want the 80-20 rule. 80% of my productivity comes from 20% of my patients. I want to focus on those patients that appreciate us the most <clears throat> and, and came to me because I was distinguished from every other dentist. There's 100 dentists in Elmhurst, at least, and, uh, and came to me for my expertise and my training. You know, uh, cosmetics is one of those things that every dentist thinks they do cosmetic dentistry until you're highly trained in cosmetics and you realize that most of us don't know that much about cosmetics. And so people find me for my cosmetic dentistry and neuromuscular dentistry, and they get comprehensive uh, treatment done, and it's very expensive treatment. I remember I had one dentist come to my office to see how I operated and she said, um, I had one patient for the morning. It was three, three hour treatment. And she said, did you collect any money for that three hour treatment? And I said, no, I had collected it um, beforehand. She prepaid for the treatment. And I remember how uncomfortable she was with that feeling. You mean you got no production uh, or no collection today? And I tried to explain to her again, we got the collection already in advance. It's okay. Yeah. But that's so uh, a-traditional. It's, a, it's against what, what we're so used to. We're, we're used to seeing a lot of patients. They pay at the time of service. And you see these, these uh, you know, dentists that hop from room to room. We didn't do that. We decided we're going to cut this down and we're going to do high-quality dentistry on fewer patients and our lives changed after 9-11. There was a one or it was about one and a half years after that where the economy was pretty depressed, but it came mm-hmm. back by 2003. And then, as you know, by mid-2007, uh, the recession or uh, the, the housing bubble burst. And uh, we went through, I'm going to say, it was probably a good eight years uh, of, of kind of an economic downturn. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you, when you're in elective practice like me, uh, I'm one of the first people to feel it. So uh, I started feeling it mid, uh, mid 07, uh, 07 uh, well, the downturn in, in uh, uh, money that was being flown uh, f- was going through the economy. So I would say the economic downturns were probably the biggest, uh, the biggest problems we've encountered in dentistry because we suffer uh, when the economy turns down. We have a certain amount of necessary dentistry that we do. Uh, but my practice is built, uh, you know, on solely elective treatment. Even your necessary dentistry, I don't really force that down patients. I tell them that, uh, you know what, if you don't want this dentistry, that's your choice. You have the right to refuse medical care. That's your freedom that you enjoy here. Uh, but if you want great dentistry, I'm happy to provide it. And so, yeah, economic, the, the economy is tough. Then when you want to reinvest in your practice, um, you want to make sure that you have a financial system in place that allows you to put aside money so that you can reinvest in your practice, remodel it, buy new technology. 
And a lot of dentists don't have that financial structure in place. I learned it when I went to business school and I learned a lot um, on how to create that, um, those reserve accounts and those investment accounts and an operating account, a management account. Uh, we're pretty sophisticated. And, and man, when you start implementing it, you see how it works. It works great even during those down economic times. Um, you know, those are, those are probably the biggest uh, problems we encounter in dentistry other than, you know, uh, every once in a while there's a patient unhappy um, and those always bother every single dentist. Uh, but we try to turn that into a positive and how can we help you? How can we turn it around? Never be afraid to apologize. Never be afraid to give a patient their money back. Never be afraid to, uh, to make it right. And that's what you should always do in business. I like so that. those are kind of the pitfalls, but I don't concentrate on those too much. I concentrate on more. What are we doing for the future? What are we doing mm-hmm. to build? What are we doing to grow? What are we doing to make people happy and healthy? Nice. Wonderful, Ivan. Thank you so much for being with us. It was a pleasure. But before we say goodbye, can you tell our listeners where they can find you? Uh, yeah, I'm easy to find. I, I'm I'm on the uh, on the internet pretty easily. Ivan Valkyrie DDS or Radiante Dental and Facial uh, Spa or Radiante Dental Facial.com. I've got a variety, but you can find me. They all lead to the same place. Uh, my email, if you want to contact me, I'm happy to give you my email. It's uh, Dr. Ivan at Radiante Dental Spa.com. Um, if you can kind of figure out how that's spelled, I'm not going to spell it out for you, but Dr. Ivan at Radiante Dental Spa.com. I'm happy to answer anybody's questions who wants to write me. Uh, you can find us online very easily. Thank you for having me, Mike. Nice. Yeah. And guys, that's all going to be in the show notes below. So if you want to reach out to Ivan, just click on the links in the show notes below and reach out to him. And Ivan, thank you so much for being with us. It was a pleasure, and we'll hear from you soon. Hey, thank you so much. I enjoyed it.